Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, gauge inflation, and it's a work in collaboration with Shain Shashapuri and Hassan Kurujay. So um, large field models are of phenomenological interest in anticipation of possible detection of B-mode polarization in the CMB in its simplest realization. It involves a massive scalar field with mass of order 10 to the power of minus 6 M Planck, and displacement of the field should be around 14 M Planck to get the 60 folds of inflation. The values of the mass and the displacement pose both theoretical and uh, model building challenges for the inflationary scenarios. Um, in this talk, I will focus on, on um, a scenario that may solve these problems or at least ameliorate these problems. We know that the world volume of n coincident D3 brain is described by supersymmetric UN gauge theory and the perpendicular directions um, of the D3 brains are uh, scalars in the adjoint representation of UN and therefore they are n times n, U, n, n, times n matrices. Uh, the DBI action for the system could be written down if the system is exposed to an RR6 form, and uh, we assume that the background is a PP wave background. Um, so in order to have the background as, as a solution to the supergravity equation, such as relation should hold, we assume that this uh, geometry is locally valid and beyond the uh, string scale, um, Stringy scales, uh, the geometry is completed to an R4 times Calabi L manifold. So expanding the DBI action up to uh, fourth order in Xi, the potential for Xi's will take this form. Making this uh, rescaling, the potential will look this for, like this, where lambda and kappa is defined in terms of uh, the string coupling and the strings of the RR6 form. So um, it's uh, difficult to uh, handle the problem uh, generally, but the, the dynamics will be simplified uh, when, um, when um, three, of, three, is, three scalar fields are proportional to the, uh, to the uh, reducible representation of this U2 algebra, generators of this U2 algebra using this U2 um, algebra relations, the potential and the action would be uh, cast, cast to this form. Uh, the process of making the kinetic term canonical for the uh, scalar field will make the, potenti uh, will make the potential look like this, where now the quartic coupling and, and cubic coupling will get rescaled by factor of n to power of 3 and n to power of 3 half, respectively. So the form of the potential is like a symmetry, this lopsided symmetry breaking potential. There are three regions that one can inflate, the region A, B, and C, and the corresponding values are given by these parameters. Uh, having a, a quartic coupling of order uh, one, bare coupling of order one, we need about uh, uh, 50,000 D3 brains to get the uh, amplitude of density perturbations correctly. So uh, we can work out the, uh, the, uh, the spectrum of masses around the SU2 generate, the SU2 sector, and there are, four there are four groups, and they have a hierarchical structure in the sense that when you increase the level of the, ma the level which is labeled by L, you, you will increase the masses. And uh, the, um, so, um, there are three regions, as I mentioned. One is phi bigger than mu, and lambda effective and, and mu, the parameters of the potential, should be uh, tuned such that, uh, tuned like this, and then the predicted n of r will be about uh, 0.96, which is close to what WMAP7 suggests. Uh, the lightest uh, ISO curvature mode is, in this sense, is in this case, is L equals to one beta mode, and the amplitude of ISO curvature perturbations at horizon scales with respect to the density perturbations is around five, ten to, uh, five, five times 10 to the power of minus four, and the uh, R is 0.2. Uh, also, for the, for the region between phi, between mu half and mu, the, the same thing is valid. And uh, so we can do the same thing. Now the amplitude of ice curvature perturbations is smaller. Uh, now uh, the, uh, also tensor perturbations will be about 5%. In both these two cases, the, um, the masses are, are, um, are positive in the sense this shows that uh, SU2 sector is, is, an, is a local attractor. 
in the sense, in the case that phi is between zero, zero and mu over two, one of the modes can get negative during part of its evolution, and it will lead to larger amplitude for Isaac curvature perturbations. And also, I should comment on the fact that in this model, due to the hierarchical structure of Isaac curvature perturbations, uh, for the masses, a few of them will contribute to the uh, to the renormalization of the Newton's constant, and therefore, um, so the ones that are smaller than the Hubble parameter, respective. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Johan uh, Blabak from Uppsala, and his title is The Problematic Back Reaction of Susi Breaking Brains. So yeah, I will talk about Problematic Back Reaction of Susi Breaking Brains, which is also the title of our <coughs> latest article. Uh, and first I will tell you something about smearing. So smearing, uh, this was mentioned a bit by Gary, but it's an often used approximation procedure where the source profile is even smeared over the transversal manifold. So instead of having uh, the delta function specifying the source position, <coughs> you replace it by a constant that integrates to the same thing. So you can see, as you can see in this picture, we have a point in one case, which I would call localized and smeared in the other. And this procedure is a consistent way to discovering gauged <coughs> supergravities and makes it easier to find supergravity solutions. But problems with using this smearing procedure is that when one wants to consider corresponding localized solution, <coughs> one does not know how much the localized differ from the smeared one. <coughs> and this is the issue for warp effective field theories. And one does not even know <coughs> if the localized solution exists necessarily if there is a smeared solution. <coughs> okay, there are solutions known to work both smeared and localized, but they are all such that the surrounding flush is mutually BTPS with the source, not necessarily a brain. And a such case is the O-plane solutions of GKP. <coughs> Our setup is the following. We have an anti sitter in seven dimensions <laughs> times an S3. <coughs> we fill the anti sitter with an anti-D6 brain. And this will give rise to an ISD flux. <coughs> And ISD stands for imaginary self-dual, and it means that if we were to dualize, t-dualize this down to a four-dimensional antisitter, the fluxes would be uh, imaginary self-dual. Okay, and this flux is non-BPS compared to the anti-brain. That's the important thing. <coughs> and here we are able to find uh, smeared solutions, but when we look at the localized, we first consider a smooth profile, so we allow the source to have some width, then there is no solution. <coughs> and we also look at the delta function, <coughs> and we again find no solution. And we have some topological-like argument as to why there is no solution, but it, uh, it builds on some boundary conditions. But for all what we consider realistic boundary conditions, there is no solution. And to exclude the rest is our next uh, project. And why does this fail? Well, let's put an anti-brain in ISD flux. Then charge-wise, they are different, hence they attract. <coughs> and tension are the same, so like masses, they attract. And net, there is some attraction. If we take the GK, GKP setup, which is BPS, and has an O-plane instead, tension would have the other sign, would be repulsive, there would be no net force. But in this case, the flux would collapse down on the brain and annihilate it. And this also answers why <coughs> only the smeared solution uh, works, since there is, in that case, no preferred point of attraction, since this brain is everywhere. When you start collecting the brain to one position, then you have somewhere the flux can attract to, and the solution uh, <coughs> fails. Okay, and what possible implications <coughs> could this lead to? And so this approach is sort of similar to Ben Agranja and Halmagi and others. Uh, just that our setup is a bit simpler. <coughs> and uh, we, our uh, approach could also have implications for uh, KKLT. Uh, since they put an anti-brain <coughs> in ISD flux to uplift their ADS to a DS, so I would like to be bold and say that we might need to reconsider the use of smeared sources in non-BPS setups, uh, especially because of its 
phenomenological implications. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, time for a quick question, if there's a question. Anyone? Okay, thank you. So, so our next speaker is Thorsten, Thorsten, Thorsten Rand yes, from right. Munich. Uh, his title is Landscape Study of Target Space Duality of uh, Zero to Hedgehog. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Thorsten Rand from Munich from the Max Planck Institute, and I want to present work today, which I did with um, Ralf Blumhagen, collaborator and supervisor. So I'm going to talk about um, heterotic Calabiao compactifications and dualities thereof. So as you all know, for a Calabiao, um, we need not only, for a um, heterotic compactification, we, need not, we don't do, need not only a Calabiao, but also a vector bundle over that Calabiao. So we want this vector bundle to break our gauge group E8 down to some gut group we're interested in then. So what kind of dualities do we know? So there's one for type 2 um, Calabiao compactifications. It's, it's called mirror symmetry, and it basically um, relates a Calabiao manifold to a topologically distinct one by, well, basically exchanging the Hodge numbers. So the number of deformations of your base manifold stays the same for both, for both sides. Then there's a generalization of this thing to heterotic compactifications where the bundle has to be involved if you want to have a duality. It's called zero to mirror symmetry. And here still the Hodge numbers exchange, so the number of deformations of the base stays the same. And well, you also get a new bundle for your mirror manifold which has the same number of bundle deformations at the end. So what we are investigating in our paper is actually a duality which is called target space duality here, basically, both the Hodge numbers change, so the total number of your base deformations change, and also the number of bundle deformations changes. But, well, at the end, you get the same moduli space, so you get the same number of deformations of your full theory. So we actually um, propose a procedure to generate um, from almost any given 0-2 model a different 0-2 model, so from one Calabiao with vector bundle, a different Calabiao with a different vector bundle that satisfies this relation and also has the same chiral spectrum. So how do we do that? Um, actually, we go to a, uh, we use the gauge and sigma model, which was introduced by Witten in 93, in order to see that. So it has a silver potential and a bosonic potential. The, the bosonic potential also includes certain fayet Eliopoulos parameters, which can take certain values. And for different values of um, these parameters, we get different phases, different um, vacuum configurations. So one may be described by a Calabi-Yau space with a vector bundle, but a different one, well, this would be a geometric one, a different one may be just a point. It is not a, not a good geometric um, one then. And it would be governed by a lander ginsburg orbifold at the end. So what do, what do these phases tell us? Um, in the silver potential I just showed you, they appear poly, um, homogeneous polynomials. Some of them define um, the properties of your bundle. Some of them define the properties of your base. So it happens now that in some non-geometric phases, these polynomials appear on, on an equal footing. So you can't really tell which one belongs to the bundle and which one belongs to the base. So this is then rather a matter of um, interpretation. So that's actually what we do. What we, do. we take a Calabiao manifold with, with a bundle, we go to some non-geometric phase, then we read off the data for a new geometric model, which is uh, topologically distinct from the first one, and well, then we compare the data in both geometric phases at the end. So this kind of um, duality was first um, explained by Dista and Katschu, and further investigated um, also by Green, Chang, Dista and um, Blumenhagen. And what we did now in our paper, we actually, um, so they did it for a model that has a Landau-Ginsburg phase, and they showed that both um, geometric models share this same Landau-Ginsburg phase. So they actually have the same Landau-Ginsburg phase. So we actually generalized this thing now to um, cases where much more um, general non-geometric phases can be involved. So then you um, compare those two phases at the end. And let me just summarize. Um, what we did in our paper, um, first of all, we proposed a general combinatorial procedure in order to um, generate such dual models from the, from the normal ones. Then what we actually also did, we proved that um, in this new model, the anomaly cancellation conditions remain satisfied once they were satisfied in the first model. 
Um, third, we tried to test this reality, so we actually um, did large volume calculations in order to, to see what happens. So we basically performed a scan of manifolds, and at the end, we scanned about 80,000 models and found actually astonishingly great agreement in the number of zero modes of your chiral spectrum in both, on both sides and also in the dimension of the modular spaces. So we interpret this actually as evidence that these are actually dualities and not transitions. So um, and that's it, what I had to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, no time for questions. Um, our next speaker is Neil Copeland from Brussels. His title is Relating Sigma Models and Double Field Theory. Yeah, well, I won't, I won't break with tradition, and I'll change the title as well. So I'm going to talk about Relating T-Duality and Variant Theories. That's the new title. And, well, you've just been told what those theories are. The first one is a, it's a, a sigma model uh, called the double formalism, a sigma model where the, it's a torus vibration and the fiber coordinates are doubled. So this formulation is due to how other people have considered uh, sigma models with duality invariance earlier, but we're gonna work in this formulation. So the ordinary coordinate x is joined by the dual coordinate x tilde in this uh, uh, blackboard x here. So the Lagrangian looks like this, it's written in terms of this uh, generalized metric curly H. Uh, and if you remember Chris Hull's talk from Tuesday, you'll be familiar with that. Uh, here it is written there. And property H has is that if you raise the index, indices here are raised with L. If you raise the indices with L, this uh, ODD invariant metric, where D is the dimension of the fiber, then you, what you get is the inverse of H. And this form of H is the most general form of H with this property. So H is going to be the metric on the fiber, and B is the anti-symmetric uh, gauge field on the tensor. So, well, what we've done here is we've doubled the number of degrees of freedom, the number of degrees of freedom by doubling the coordinates on the fiber. Uh, so we need to half that again in order to get back to the number of degrees of freedom we started with, so that we impose a constraint. So if we impose this constraint, which is written in terms of L and H again, and the word world sheet Hodge dual. Uh, this theory is classically equivalent to the ordinary string. Uh, and what about quantum equivalence? Well, you can do a background field expansion. So if you recall, uh, for the ordinary string sigma model, uh, classical while invariance to extend to quantum theory at one loop, the beta functionals must also vanish at this order. And you can calculate these beta functions by doing a background field expansion, expanding quantum fluctuations around the classical backgrounds using the background field method. If you do this for the only background field being a metric G, then the, the, reach, the uh, beta function is the Ricci tensor. So the, the vanishing of this is just that the background should be Ricci flat. If you include B in a delta one, you get the same, uh, the vanishing of the beta function is the same equations of motion as you get from uh, supergravity, or the, the same supergravity fields as the NS sector of the string. And so you identify this as the effective action for string theory. You probably remember that. So, uh, can we do this for the doubled formalism? Back in 2007, uh, along with Dave Berman and Dan Thompson, we, we did this. So, first you have to incorporate this constraint into the action, uh, and you can use a PST method for that, and you end up with this action where the Lorentz on the fiber, where the Lorentz invariance is no longer manifest. And again, it's written in terms of the two different metrics, L and H. So, the vanishing of the beta functional here is written in terms of the vanishing of some tensor W, uh, some which uh, runs over all the coordinates, including the double coordinates on the fiber. And this is not the same as the Ricci tensor of this double metric H, uh, though there are some similarities on the base. Part of this W is the Ricci tensor on the base. But if you plug in the form of H and plug a form of L into this W, you find that the equations are equivalent to the original string that you started with. So at one loop, it is equivalent as well. So. The other theory we're going to talk about is double field theory, so I won't say very much about this, because Chris talked about this on Tuesday. He uh, said there, there's this level matching constraint, and if you impose a strong version of this constraint, then the fields are restricted, and you can formulate it in terms of this generalized metric H, which you recognize from the slides before. Uh, so if you look at the equation of motion, uh, it's the equation of motion is the vanishing of this tensor R, basically. So it's this Ricci-like tensor R is the equation of motion. 
So if we compare these, uh, uh, we have to look at this special fiber background in which the doubled formalism is defined. So we take uh, all the fields not to depend on fiber coordinates, the double fiber coordinates, and we take them not to depend on the dual coordinate of the base. And we plug these conditions into the, this tensor uh, curly R, then what we get is the vanishing, it's equivalent to W. So what's this basically saying is that the uh, effective the field theory for this double formalism is the same as this restricted double field theory. Uh, and what's very important in this is the, the role of R, which is act, this curly R is acting like a Ricci tensor. So another question we can go on and ask, is there some uh, differential geometry in which we can understand uh, where this R comes from? And Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Jose Edelstein from the University of Santiago de Com or Compostela. And his title is Love Lovelock Gravity and Gravity and Radiation. Thank you. Consider that you want to analyze uh, holographically uh, superconformal uh, field theories with uh, non equal uh, central charges, A different from Z. Then you have to turn on uh, higher curvature corrections in the gravity side. For instance, the gauss monet uh, correction in five dimensions. Um, in, in, the coefficient of the gauss monet term is basically proportional to the difference between Z, Z minus A, and if you want to consider theories in which Z minus A uh, is, uh, are finite in units of C, then you have to consider theories with uh, gauss -Bonnet, uh, the coefficient of gauss monet finite. It has been recently shown that uh, this uh, theory has some causality problems in this, uh, except whenever this uh, parameter is in this range. And on the other hand, in the CFT side, it has been shown that uh, A over C in any uh, N equals one superconformal field theory has to lie in this range. And that the holographic bile anomaly makes a perfect matching between these two, uh, the, these two windows. I want to extend this to higher uh, curvature uh, uh, corrections, even higher than quadratic. For them, uh, we have the canonical problem that higher curvature theories typically have ghosts, unless we consider a particular uh, kind of theories that are the Lovelock gravities. They are schematically the, the sum of different terms involving different powers of the curvature, and they are theories that do, don't have go, uh, ghosts. Uh, for instance, well, the zero theory is the cosmological term. This is the Einstein-Hilbert term. This is the gauss bonnet And the cubic one has already this ugly uh, aspect. Uh, the price to pay is that you have to, the, the order of the theory is related to the dimension of the space time. So, in order to go to higher order low block theories, you have to go to higher dimensions. But okay, even if the theory looks uh, difficult, amazingly, the structure is uh, quite simple. The, the theory has many vacua, k vacua, that are given by the roots of this polynomial. Uh, there are some uh, roots of this polynomial that uh, define vacua with some instabilities that are generalizations of Bolver and Deserts. Um, basically, this is the condition that you get for a well-behaved uh, vacua. And then, amazingly, you can find exactly uh, analytical implicit solutions for black, hole, for black holes in these uh, theories. Um, okay. <coughs> uh, let, let's see what, uh, uh, what can we check from in the ADSCFT dictionary. Uh, for, for instance, the two-point function for whatever uh, d-dimensional CFT, even if we don't know if there is a d-dimensional, arbitrary d-dimensional CFT, and if it's a Salagrange or not, probably not. Uh, well, the, the, the would-be theory would have a stress energy tensor, and the conformal field theory structure only, uh, well, fixes the, the two-point correlation function, except for this central charge. And you can do the holographic computation of this central charge in low block theory, it gives you this result. And then you can see that in this, uh, in this entry of the dictionary, you can read off the fact that uh, the branches that are not ruled out by Bolvar Design instabilities are precisely those branches that lead to unitary CFTs in principle. OK, what about the extension of causality violation versus positivity of the energy to higher curvature theories that, that I mentioned in the first uh, slide? OK, you can do a very uh, quite involved computation that uh, can be done actually in two different ways. And you can see that generically, you, can have a, a, you also find a window in which the theories are allowed. The window is given by this expression where everything is encoded in this uh, polynomial epsilon. <coughs> And uh, so, and there, there are some, so this is, a, I will mention the relation of this to, with the CFT side, but there are some other instabilities in the, in the, in the theory whose CFT um, partner is uh, quite, quite uncertain at this point. 
So recall this, uh, this particular uh, window that I'm mentioning here. If you go to the uh, CFT side, you can define this operator, and you can compute the expectation value of this operator that is given in terms of three and two point functions of the stress tensor. This is the conformal uh, symmetry fixes everything except this coefficient. And you can see that this coefficient has to be in this window for the, the energy to be positive. And exactly this gives you the entry of the dictionary that, that then you can check by an holographic violent anomaly computation. Then you can basically find for three-point functions the full dictionary for all the coefficients of the CFT in terms of the uh, low block couplings. And uh, you can, uh, for, for instance, in the cubic uh, low block theory, you can see that the region of allowed uh, parameters is, is given here. And this, in particular, modifies the, the, the minimum value of the shear viscosity over the entropy density that is related to the maximum value of lambda that you can find. OK, I will leave you with the conclusions, and I will uh, wait for one question, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for a very quick question. <laughs> question, question. If not, I continue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, okay. I was about to prove uh, meanwhile as crazy conjecture, but I don't have time. <laughs> okay, uh, okay our next speaker's Tom Hartman. No, that's, a, that's not right. <laughs> you want to just, just go? Yeah, go I don't think I could give that talk very well. OK, so our next speaker is Tom Hartman from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. His title is Higher Spin Gravity and the DSCFT Correspondent. OK, thank you. Hi, so um, I'm going to tell you about a paper to appear with Dionysius Aninos on quantum gravity and de Sitter space. So the main result of this work is to provide or to conjecture an explicit realization, microscopic realization, of the DS-CFT correspondence. So DS-CFT, which we heard about earlier this week, if it exists at all, uh, is very different from ADS-CFT. And the reason for that, at least part of the reason for that, is the conformal structure of de Sitter space. So the conformal boundary in de Sitter space is time-like, and this leads to some strange requirements for the potential dual CFT. So nonetheless, um, there's, a, there's a proposal 10 years ago, various proposals 10 years ago, put together using the analogy of ADS-CFT, put together a general dictionary uh, for how DS-CFT should work. But um, explicit examples uh, were not constructed. So our claim, that's the background. Now our claim is that an explicit example can be constructed in higher spin gravity. So this is done by constructing a de Sitter analog of the Klebanov-Polyakov correspondence relating the ON model to higher spin gravity in ADS. So in the de Sitter case, the bulk theory is the Vasiliev theory of higher spin gravity in four-dimensional de Sitter space. It has an infinite tower of massless higher spin fields. And the uh, dual CFT is a free, a, free, a free field model that we call the SPN model. It's a strange CFT. It has anti-commuting scalar fields and is therefore non-unitary. But uh, remember that this theory lives on the Euclidean time-like conformal boundary of de Sitter space, and Euclidean CFTs don't need to be unitary, so that's not a problem. So um, that's the idea. In the remaining time, um, I'll just put the details up here. So um, on the first line, here is the Lagrangian of the, propo of the uh, proposed dual CFT, the SPN CFT. This is the free version. Uh, as in the ON model, there's an also an interacting critical version of the CFT that's also dual to higher spin gravity. So chi here is an anti-commuting scalar field. Omega is the anti-symmetric symplectic form. And this theory has invariance under SPN rotations of chi. This theory can be motivated by taking the analytic continuation of the ON model under n to minus n. This flips the sign of the cosmological constant and takes you from ADS to DS. So there are uh, basically three pieces of evidence for this proposal. The first is the spectrum of operators. The operators in the bulk and boundary match. The second is an RG flow. So much like the ON model, the SPN model has a uh, double trace deformation that triggers an RG flow to an interacting critical point. And um, this RG flow can be, the same transformation can be interpreted in the bulk theory as taking 
a Fourier transform of the wave function of the universe, and this matches to the boundary. Finally, we've checked that the three-point correlation functions of the bulk Vasiliev theory exactly match with the uh, three-point correlation functions predicted by the SPN CFT. So a priori, this would be a difficult computation, but luckily, all of the work has already been done by Jiambi and Yin in the context of ADS. And the results in De Sitter space, in fact, all of the checks in De Sitter space um, can, be, can be done fairly easily by trivial modifications of the checks of the klebanov polykov conjecture in uh, ADS-CFT. So um, in conclusion, if this duality is, is correct, then uh, it raises the possibility of using higher spin gravity as a toy model for quantum cosmology. That is, um, an exactly solvable theory of quantum gravity uh, in De Sitter space. Of course, it's only a toy model because um, higher spin theory has this infinite tower of massless higher spin fields, and there's no apparent, or at least no uh, known limit that gives ordinary gravity uh, in four dimensions. OK, thank you. Time for a very quick question. Maybe I can ask the question. Uh, is, is, could, could you do the same sort of analytic continuation to n equals four Yang Mills and get? No, this is very special to uh, vector theories because in that case, um, you need the cosmological constant going like n, not n squared. And um, if you tried to do this in n equals four super Yang Mills, you'd have to try to find a CFT which computed the correlators of Yang Mills at n equals imaginary, and I don't know how to do that. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Hirota Ayuri from hey. Taiwan, and his uh, title is Stokes Phenomena in Integrable Structures and Non-Critical String Theory and M-Theory. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm Hirotaka Ide from the NCTS uh, Taiwan, and then this work is the uh, collaboration with uh, Chan Zhong Chang and then Jishen Ye. Okay. Uh, the, our, our work is about the non-critical string theory and the multi cartwright model. And then, in, in general, uh, we know that if we consider the, uh, uh, after, after uh, non-critical string theory appear in the some uh, after scaling limit of the mathematics model, and then if that critical point have uh, one tail or one cut, then this corresponds to bosonic string. And then, if you have two cut, two tail or two cut. Uh, this corresponds to the types of superstring theory. So it's a natural question, uh, 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 what, which kind of string theory corresponds to the multi-cut, multi-tail uh, critical point? And then we propose the answer, and this is a fractional superstring theory. And then uh, fractional superstring theory is the kind of uh, generalization of string theory. On the wall seat, we have the boson and the parafermion. Okay, this is a special crit critical point being considered here. Okay, then they, we obtain the uh, spectral curve in the uh, multi cut width model. And uh, it's known that uh, in the one cut, two cut case, in the bosonic superstring case, this curve is given by the Trebuchet polynomial. And then we con uh, next consider the uh, ZK symmetric distribution of the spectral curve. Then we obtain that is the Jacobi polynomial. And then, uh, and then if, you con uh, if you consider the fraction superstring critical point, then we obtain the, some generalization of the uh, Trebuchet polynomial. And then this is a, a, a concrete form. And then th this algebraic curve, algebraic equation for the algebraic uh, spectral curve is given by the, like this. And T is the Trebuchet polynomial. And then this kind of form is the exactly the same as the one cut, two cut critical point. It's Trebuchet polynomial. And then the difference is that this here is index P and Q. This fits the level the critical point, but that is not the uh, uh, co-prime. This, but, but this is a, a weak difference. And then because of that, this algebraic equation uh, com, uh, almost factorized. And then this is a, a concrete uh, uh, actu what ha actually happened here. So we have the multi cut. So this wavy line is a cut. And then uh, what happened here? Maybe we can say in this way. Uh, perturbative string series are located in each angle. So for example, if you if look at this angle, uh, here we observe this series of bosonic string in the perturbation theory. 
And here, we observe the type of superstring theory. And then in this another angle, maybe we have another fraction superstring theory. And, and so, and then these string theories are completely decoupled uh, in the all order perturbation theory. So this is the reason why we have the uh, factorization here. And this situation uh, resembles the proposal by the Hojava Kira in 2005 about the non-critical M theory. And they say that uh, if you add the angular direction, which is in invisible uh, in the perturbation theory, then uh, non-critical string becomes uh, looks like M theory. So this uh, our multi model also realized that kind of situation. So it is another realization of non-critical M theory. And then here uh, we obtain the spectral curve, but uh, another more uh, uh, information, which is out of the perturbation theory, is the Stokes phenomena. How to uh, arrange these uh, string theory one, two, three, or two, three, four? So this is the next work. So we consider the Stokes phenomena in this critical point. And, uh, it, uh, and it's uh, mathematically, this is a system. And uh, anyway, uh, we got a solution. And then that solution is labeled by some uh, Young diagram. And then uh, in math mathematically, it's, it's say, people say that it's very difficult to obtain the Stokes multiplier in a very general case. But we got a solution. The reason is that we found that some physical condition, which we call the uh, multi-cut boundary condition, and then that gives uh, some uh, equation, which help us to obtain the Stokes multiplier. And actually, this interestingly, this equation is nothing but a bunch of the TQ relation of the quantum integral system. So it's a, 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 a first re, a, a new uh, a relation between the quantum integral system and the non-critical string. And then maybe, uh, uh, finally, uh, let me uh, uh, say the relation to the Chekoti buffer. Uh, our case is... Sorry. <laughs> um, our next speaker is Nicholas Johansson from Vienna. And his title is Holograms of Conformal John Simons Grab. Yes, thank you very much. That's precisely right. So I will speak about something done with uh, this, this is work that will appear soon with, with Hamid Afshar, Branislav Svetkovic, Sabina Ertel, and Daniel Grohmeller, the two last two are in the audience. So we study a particularly simple three-dimensional theory of gravity, which consists only of the gravitational and chern simons terms, the uh, chern simons terms in terms of the Levitivita connection. And this is completely topological. It has no degrees of freedom locally. Uh, it has two kinds of gauge symmetry, so diffeomorphisms and wild invariance, local wild invariance. Uh, but non-trivial dynamics appear if you uh, in induce a boundary, or put the, man uh, the theory on a manifold with boundary. So we perform holographic description of this, and this includes a lot of stuff, all about you can, uh, which you can read about in the upcoming paper. Today I will focus, due to lack of time, uh, on, on a particular uh, part of this, and this is what does the wild symmetry turn into when a boundary is taken into account. So what do I mean by that turn into? Well, let's review as a warm-up the 2 plus 1 dimensional Einstein-Hilbert gravity on, a, on an asymptotic ADS space. So this has only the diffeomorphisms as gauge symmetry. Uh, and, but putting this on a boundary, uh, for instance, an asymptotic ADS boundary, so here at y equals 0, uh, and imposing some boundary conditions, then the diffeomorphism must respect these boundary conditions. But uh, some of the diffeomorphisms that do, do not vanish at the boundary, and in the canonical realization, that means that they require a boundary piece. So that means that the constraints uh, turn from, from first class to second class, so a gauge symmetry turn into a global symmetry. And this global symmetry is, of course, just two copies of of Virasoro for this particular case. So the question is what happens then in, in Sean Simon's gravity? What happens to the wild symmetry? So first of all, we have to impose some boundary conditions. And what we choose then is something that looks like asymptotic ADS times a uh, wild factor. And the rationale behind this is that the wild factor does not show up in the equations of motion since the theory is, is wild invariant. Uh, and the gauge transformations then that preserves these boundary conditions depends crucially on the boundary conditions that we put on, on phi. 
So for instance, if we put phi constant equal to zero, non-surprisingly, we find back only the diffeomorph that the diffeomorphisms are non-trivial at the boundary, and we get again two times two copies of Vera Soro with opposite central charges because the theory is, is parity odd. Uh, the wild charges, however, are trivial, so these are just a gauge symmetry still. If we choose phi to be some fixed function, then we still just get two copies of Vera Soro. However, uh, then we must compensate the diffeomorphism with, with some wild rescaling to, re to keep the, the function a fixed fixed because a diffeomorphism would, would in general change it. The wild charges, the pure wild charges are still trivial, so this is still just a gauge symmetry. However, if we allow phi to be any free function that can vary between different states in the theory, then we get finally a non-trivial wild charge, and this is the interesting new thing that I speak about now, so to speak. Uh, right. So, uh, imposing that this, these charges are conserved, that gives some, some consistency conditions on, on uh, the function phi. So there are many possible things that you can, can study, many possible variants of these this consistency conditions, but one particularly simple is assuming that phi is just some function of one of the light cone coordinates on the boundary, so say of x plus, and that imposes then the same uh, condition on omega, omega being the parameter in, in the wild transformation. Uh, and, and doing uh, this uh, gives rise then to two copies of, of the Virasor algebra, uh, still, these are the, the combination between wild rescalings and diffeomorphisms, uh, and a tower of, of uh, operators that are, look precisely like in a fine new one, so precisely like the modes of a scalar field. And uh, precisely when these condi consistency conditions hold, are you allowed to perform a Sugavara shift to define sort of a full, uh, full uh, Virasol algebra that generates just diffeomorphisms at the boundary, and this then shifts the central charge by one in one of the Vera Solver algebras. So that is the punchline. Uh, introducing this free function phi sort of induces a background chiral sky scalar field at the boundary. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid no time for questions. <laughs> yes, I... Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Johan Kallen from Uppsala. His title is Cosmological Localization of Chen Simon's Theory. Yes, thank you. So my talk is about path integral localization of Chen Simon's Theory on ciphered manifolds. And I will do that in a new way, which I think is pretty nice. So now listen up. So here's the setup. So I will consider chern simons gauge theory on a compact free manifold with a simple, compact, and simply connected gauge group. And this theory is, of course, has a very long, in interesting history with relations to different parts of math and physics. And theories like this, it's, of course, very interesting to find different ways of doing calculations. So according to today's fashion, I want to do path integral localization of chern simons theory. But as we've seen in previous talks in this conference, the very least you need in your theory in order to do path integral localization is some kind of odd symmetry. And in the original formulation of chern simons theory, there is no such odd symmetry. So you have to do something with the theory. And that we can do. What we can do is to introduce a set of auxiliary fields together. And these auxiliary fields are fermions and bosons. Uh, odd and even fields, together with an odd symmetry, such that this odd symmetry acts like an equivariant differential on the space of fields. And now we are in business to do localization. And this odd symmetry, we can introduce that on any compact orientable three manifold. It involves a choice of a so-called contact structure, uh, but that always exists in these cases. So this is the main result of this uh, talk. That's why I put it in a box. However, in order to localize, we have to require something more, which will restrict ourselves down to so-called ciphered manifolds. So these manifolds are U1 vibrations over a Riemann surface. Uh, if we're on these ciphered manifolds, then we have every ingredients uh, we need in order to do, use the Ataya Bot Berlinge Vergu localization formula, 
in order to reduce the originally infinite dimensional path integral down to something finite dimensional. Of course, in order to introduce such auxiliary fields and odd symmetry in this nice way, it's not so easy to guess. It comes from somewhere. And of course, it comes from uh, something which uh, has been done before. And it comes from n equal to 2 supersymmetric Chern Simons theory, which Kapustin, Villet, and Yakov localized on S3. The funny thing with n equal to 2 supersymmetric Chern Simons theory is that all the superpartners of the gauge field are auxiliary. So it's the same thing as Chern Simon theory. So that's where the auxiliary field comes from and the odd symmetry. However, if we want to mimic what they did on S3 on more general manifolds, we have to twist the theory. And that we can do. And that's how we obtain the structure I showed on the last slide. And this twisting involves the choice of a so-called contact structure. Uh, of course, the results we obtain with this method agrees with other results in the uh, path integral uh, approaches to Chern Simons theory. For example, non abelian localization by Beasley and Witten a few years ago, and abelianization by Lau and Thompson. Uh, here I, sh I should maybe have had some kind of nice formula to flash for you uh, in order to show that, I mean, we're actually calculating something. In, in the simplest cases, these, this Chern Simons theory uh, reduced to some, a matrix model, but I don't have this formula here, but trust me, we can calculate. Okay, I'm in good shape here. So here's a summary of my talk. So I described, or I told you, a new way to do path integral localization in Chern Simons theory on ciphered manifolds. And it's done by introduction of auxiliary fields and an odd symmetry. And it's obtained by twisting the method introduced by Kapushkin, Villet, and Yakov on S3. And uh, a small little outlook. This, if we stay on S3, this what I call twisting before, it's basically a change of variables. But using this change of variables, the, this localization uh, computation sort of technically simplifies a little. And possibly it can offer an alternative and more efficient method to do calculations in other three-dimensional uh, gauge theories. For example, these chern simons plus matter theories, if properly understood. Uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Nima Lashkari uh, from McGill, and his title is Dis The Dissertaire Ferry. Thank you. Um, this is a work in collaboration with Alejandro Castro and Alex Maloney from McGill University. Um, so today I'll be talking about quantum gravity in the Cedar space. And as you probably know, there are certain conceptual problems with uh, such a theory, if it exists. For example, there, we don't really know how to define observables, what are the observables, or what is the nature of the entropy of cosmological horizons. Or how does quantum gravity could alter the physics of an observer in the serious space? So in this talk, I'll try to address the third question, the third problem. And we do so by constructing a Euclidean partition function for pure gravity for three-dimensional the serious space as a sum over geometry. The, the reason that we do it for three dimensions is that, as you will see, the question is more manageable in three dimensions. So, um, so what is our philosophy? What's new in this method? So our philosophy is that we're going to, because it's only the static patch over here, the triangle over here. Yeah. It's only the static patch that is relevant for the physics of an observer in the series space. When we're going to Euclidean space, we're going to only consider the Euclidean um, continuation of the, we're going to consider the Euclidean continuation of only the, the, series, the, the static patch of the series space. So what does this give us? In addition to the standard three sphere that we usually consider as a Euclidean continuation of the series space, we get a whole new set of smooth, I'm sorry, smooth manifolds that are locally S3. And with these set of identifications for two uh, co-prime number, that are parameters by two co-prime numbers, P and Q. There is a natural interpretation that comes with these manifolds. As you can see, if you just look at this identification, it suggests that these 
saddle points actually represent a grand canonical ensemble with this temperature and this angular potential. So what's our goal? Our goal is to compute the exact partition function for three-dimensional distributed gravity with all the perturbative and non-perturbative uh, contributions. So how are going to we achieve this task? It's twofold. First of all, we should be able to identify all classical solutions of all the solutions of the classical equations, equations of motion. And second, we should be able to compute this uh, infinite series of corrections around each saddle point to be able to compute this partition function up here. There is a sum over topologies, and by the sum over topologies, we are going to consider the sum only on these length spaces that I was talking about because we actually know how to interpret them, and they are smooth. And moreover, if they actually have anything, if there is any, um, if they're the only things that are, if it's only the uh, static patch that's relevant for the physics of an observer in the serious space, they seem to be natural. It seems to be natural to consider them when we're computing the partition function of the sphere gravity. So what's the technique that we're using? The technique is just a simple rewriting of gravity in terms of chern simons degrees of freedom. And we're using the, the known results in the chern simons literature to compute this full partition function. So what do we find? We find some nice expression at the end of the day is log of four sines. OK, it's, you can write it in one line. But there's an interesting observation. It turns out that this partition function actually has a piece that is not regularizable. So it diverges, and you cannot render it regularized, uh, regulate. You cannot regulate it. So uh, what does this imply? What is the conclusion? There are three possibilities. First, maybe the zero gravity does not exist. It's not as a sensible theory of quantum gravity. Second possibility is that if pure Einstein gravity is pathological, maybe we should include matter. So in another work, more recently, with the same collaborators, we can see topological massive gravity. And it turns out that in the inclusion of the graviton, the massive graviton mode gets rid of the, uh, this in divergence and makes renders it theory finite. Third possibility, we've just missed a physical point. We're computing the wrong thing. Maybe there's boundary data that's important. Maybe there's something else that we don't understand. Thank you so much. Time for a very quick question. Yes. What about DS4? Oh, the case of DS4, you mean the computation of the partition function? Well, there is, we can't really classify all the solutions of classical equation of motion, right? So we're stuck at the first point. It's, a very, it's way more difficult in four dimensions, or dimensions more than three. Three dimensions is exceptional where we can actually do the computation. Thanks a lot. OK, our next speaker is Oliver uh, Schlotterer. Schlotterer. OK, <laughs> from NPI Munich. And his title is The Endpoint Open String Disk Amplitude Demystified. Hello, everybody. I want to present the main results of a series of papers written in collaboration with Carlos Mafra, my supervisor, Stefan Stieberger, and partly with Dimitris Zimpis. Hello. I don't know. <laughs> Can I have a substitute? <laughs> ah, OK. Yeah, uh, essentially, I want to show you um, a very general formula for tree level scattering of massless open string states. We have worked out uh, the endpoint amplitude for any number of external legs, and we have uh, found that it obtains a really, really compact form. More precisely, the color ordered open string amplitude on the left hand side with n external legs always decomposes into a linear combination of field theory amplitudes of the underlying super Young Mills theory. So here these guys in green are n minus three factorial sub amplitudes of Young Mills theory. And each of them is decorated by a hypergeometric function, F sigma. And this is the, the only dependence on the Reggie slope alpha prime. So all the stringy physics is sitting in this uh, F sigma. And uh, I have to emphasize, this is a really novel result in amplitudeology, because uh, before this uh, work, only the six-point amplitudes have been computed in 10 dimensions for superstring theory. And it was not realized that even the five-point function can be arranged uh, into super Young Mills building blocks. 
a nice consistency check for this result here is uh, the low energy limit as you take alpha prime to zero. Uh, the, this guy is supposed to be reduced to the young Mills amplitude. And indeed, the functions f sigma behave such that the sum collapses to just one term with the correct color ordering. And uh, this formula here is valid. Uh, even in compactification to lower dimensions. For instance, you can go to four dimensions and compute gluon scattering there. And the relation is valid for the full SUSY multiplet, uh, which, is, which is shared by the gluon. So depending on how much SUSY you want to preserve in four dimensions, it can be the full n equal four super young Mills multiplet, or it's just a, glu a gluon if you want to be minimalistic. How did we get there? <clears throat> the method uh, is crucially resting on the pure spinner formalism, which you might have seen in the very nice talk by Michael Green. Uh, the main virtue of this formalism is that the uh, full computation is manifestly space-time supersymmetric in all steps of the computation. And moreover, the underlying CFT is a free field theory. There are no interactions like you have it in the RNS formalism uh, with the Ramon spin field. And uh, this pure spinner formalism allowed us to obtain a very compact form for the 10-dimensional super young Mills amplitude. So here are the field theory constituents which had to be identified within the string computation in order to ar arrive at the very compact end result. And uh, yeah, we have uh, written this 10-dimensional super young Mills amplitude as a very compact sum of some superspace objects M and V, which I cannot define due to lack of time. But I can guarantee they have a really nice diagrammatic interpretation. You can uh, discover the factorization property of the field theory amplitude by uh, these guys here. And um, this formula is valid for any uh, helicity configuration. Beyond four dimensions, you cannot uh, rest on MHV and related results. So we capture any n to the k MHV amplitude in four dimensional language. Then I should tell you some extra value of this uh, formula for the open string endpoint amplitude. First of all, these pure spinner methods allow you to explicitly uh, compute the BCJ numerators. If you remember the nice talk by Henrik Johansen, he told you that uh, gauge theory amplitudes can be nicely parameterized in terms of certain numerator factors, and they can be brought into a gauge where they satisfy dual Jacobi identities. So uh, the same algebraic structure which you have for the structure constant for the color factor. However, generically, they fail to satisfy the Jacobi identities. It all rests on a particularly clever gauge. And the pure spinner methods allow us to compute the ends in the exactly right gauge. You get this for free. See uh, the paper from April. And the second extra virtue uh, of this uh, result is, let's go to a more general color ordering for the superstring amplitude. <clears throat> um, in that case, uh, you get the same sum of super young Mills building blocks. But now the color ordering is encoded in the integrate, integration region for the, for the hypergeometric function. And now if you take the alpha prime to zero limit of this equation, you can explicitly derive the BCJ relations. Remember from Henrik's talk, the BCJ relations in field theory tell you they are, that they are only n minus three factorial independent subamplitudes. In other words, any other subamplitude with any color ordering can be decomposed into a basis with n minus three factorial elements only. Yeah, and we can compute the expansion coefficients by the field theory limits of the integrals. This is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. No time for a question, I'm afraid. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Shaheen Sheikh Jabbari from IPM Tehran. And the, the title of his talk is uh, um, Gauge Flation, Inflation from Non-Abelian Gauge Fields. So I'm going to tell you about uh, a new arena for uh, building up inflationary models. That's uh, basically inflation driven by non-abelian gauge fields, and which have dubbed as uh, uh, gauge flation. That this is a, a work in progress. The first part of it is, has appeared in these two papers. That's uh, in, basically done with my student. So uh, the world. Uh, the universe viewed through CMB 50 years ago was looking like this. It was homogeneous and isotropic. But now it looks like this because we have improved uh, a lot on the precision. And we have been able to quantify these fluctuations uh, basically through these parameters, which are the power spectrum of the fluctuations, which is of order 10 to minus 9, the spectral field and the non-observation of uh, 
gravity waves has led to this bound for this R. Uh, so the setting that I'm going to introduce is basically uh, uh, the, we have a gauge field, non-abelian gauge field, which is going to, a part of it is going to be playing the role of implanton. Uh, let's take the, for simplicity, let's take the gauge group to be SU2. And uh, I'm going to take, for this stage, uh, this is the generic Lorentz and gauge invariant action that one can consider. And uh, I'm going to be within the uh, FRW uh, type cosmology. And the, uh, uh, the problem that uh, usually arises when we want to uh, use anything other than scalars as inflaton is, uh, for example, the gauge field here, is that we'll, turning on a gauge field will break the rotational symmetry. But here, since we are dealing with the gauge fields, it's possible to retain that rotational symmetry as a part of the uh, a global part of the gauge symmetry because gauge fields are defined up to gauge transformations. In particular, that's basically, uh, if we consider this kind of field configurations, uh, this phi uh, up to the scale factor is going to be scalar. And uh, basically, uh, one can easily show that uh, this specific configuration uh, could uh, uh, the dynamics in this specific configuration is uh, uh, consistently reduced to the mm, uh, scalar field, and, and this is described by the scalar field, and it's completely homogeneous and isotropic. So now I want to do model building, and I need to choose the, what the action is. So far, it was just mm, generic. So of course, you know that the angles action, which is the most obvious, is not going to do its job because it's scaling invariant, and uh, p would be equal to a third of rho. That's not. Mm, useful for doing inflation. So that's just, mm, we, we need to add some other terms. This is just for the model building to show that the idea works. Uh, this, let's add this very specific f to the four term. Uh, so this model has uh, two parameters, the Yangles coupling and this kappa. And uh, one can work out the dynamics, basically the, these are different equations. And it's possible to show that uh, the, mm, the theory, <laughs> I mean, the dynamics has a slow row. Uh, so this is, for example, for some specific values of the parameters here. Uh, this is the uh, psi field, which is, and this is the slow row region, and then this is the end of inflation, and it starts oscillating. Uh, so uh, we have studied this uh, two-parameter uh, model uh, uh, in detail, and it happens that this is very robust against perturbations around this specific isotropic solution that we are uh, going through. And uh, uh, that's not enough. We need to do perturbations. And basically, this is the result of the cosmic perturbation theory. We have the power spectrum, spectral field, and the, the rest. And we now uh, basically confront this with the cosmic data. That's basically the result. Uh, so, so basically, this, re this is the plot. Uh, the, this gamma and n are given in terms of the parameters of our model, and this is the region which is allowed. In terms of the interesting parameters that we have in our model, basically the uh, kappa is the scale, which is 10 to 13 GV, and the G angles is of order 10 to minus 3. And one of the predictions of this specific model is that we have sizable tensor to scalar ratio. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ayn. No time for questions, I'm afraid. Okay, our next speaker is Bhupendranath Tiwari from Rome. His title is Statistical Fluctuations in Black Holes. I thank the organizer. The talk, uh, the title of the presentation is If Typical Fluctuation and Black Hole. So I will consider fluctuation of a black hole with finitely many parameters like charge, anti-charge, mass, angular momentum, and if other any. And then try to uh, understand are these configuration are if table or not under the if typical fluctuation. So some motivation are in this paper by Rupenier and Weinhold in long time ago. And here we focus on the if string theory and M theory black hole. And I will present one example. Uh, although there are some application in condensed matter, quarkonium configuration, and other also. And then there are some uh, 
physics of black hole at zero temperature and non-zero temperature that we also consider, but I will not present here. The purpose is to understand the stability of black hole and phase transition. And the brief review that given entropy as a function of charges, anti-charges, similar momenta, and so on, you can make Taylor expansion, and the second term is the Hessian, and this describes a Riemannian structure. That means, in other words, we consider a probability distribution in terms of the parameter of the black hole and in the Gaussian limit. With this normalization, we want to understand its geometric property. So the question which we want to understand that given distribution is because our number of brain, anti-brain, and which are forming the black hole are under what condition they correspond to a stable uh, Riemannian structure on the statistical configuration. So the first thing is that the heat capacity should be positive, gives local uh, stability, and the global stability requires that all the principal minor of the Hessian of the entropy should be positive. Long-range correlation can be understood due to this thing that scalar curvature is proportional to the correlation volume, Alternate option is to calculate the divergent part of the free energy obtained from the partition function. These were introduced in Rupenier by long time, and this R goes infinity will give some sort of phase transition. And here we find some Widom type of uh, spiral curve. Well, there are some alpha tail of the distribution, but, uh, but we have uh, not uh, studied here. And this, the eutectical property also follow from the counting of degeneracy. Okay, so the first example, the last example, which we consider is the half BPF black hole. These were studied in the liquid droplet model and football model. Some differences are here. Well, then in energy, uh, energy average energy in the, in the canonical fluctuation for this black hole has two chemical potential, lambda and T. And if energy, then we have to take the half unit in the wine hole driven tension and the, this component of this fluctuation are given by this. Determinant can be written as this with this function and curvature can be expressed at this very nicely without any approximation, no if drilling approximation. Alternate thing is to go to the counting, and counting involves a Young diagram with some fluctuation, some excitation in this trial, and this is the vacuum. We can also calculate the component of the Rupenier matrix. This describes local fluctuation. This term, local fluctuation requires this stability, and global one requires positivity of this. And there is the curvature can be found exactly this. Another thing is sub-ensemble theory. In the infinitely many sub-ensemble, configuration become non-interacting. All the correlation can be summarized in terms of these two. And there are some geometric property embedding to high dance manifold, like supersymmetric to non-supersymmetric, extremal, non-extremal. There are many other black hole, black string, and so on. This offers a fluctuation property of black holes. Thank you. Thank you. Time for a very quick question. If somebody has a question. Okay, thank you. Um, our, our last speaker for today is uh, Hagen Triangle uh, from Sackley. His title is Gauged N equals four supergravity from Calabria L3. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to talk today about work in progress together with Ash, uh, Amir, Amir Kashanipur and Ruben Minazian in Paris. Uh, but uh, some of the technical tools are also based on work with Jan Louis and collaborators in Hamburg. So I have this picture here that you have seen a lot of times and you have stared off it, on it a lot of times. And um, I want to convince you today that even though people have worked on this for a very long time, there are still st new structures to discover in Calabriau compactifications. And uh, I will specify today on some gauged n equals four supergravity you can find from Calabriau compactifications. So the, the Calabriaus I talk about are Calabriaus for order number zero, 
So in, in type two complexifications, there are perturbative corrections to the holomorphic p potential of the scalar manifold that are proportional to the Euler number. So, but if the Euler number vanishes, maybe there should be some reason why, the, why these perturbative corrections vanish. And um, so, so that was the, ask, uh, the, the question we started from. And actually, there's a Hopf index theorem that says when it vanishes, there exists a nowhere vanishing one form or a vector a v on, on the manifold. So if we have a Calabiao with SU3 holonomy, so that means we have one covalently constant spinner, we can construct by this one form a second spinner out of this, uh, which is maybe not currently closed, but still this defines an SU2 structure that has been um, analyzed in this series of papers by various people. So the expectation is because we have now two spinners instead of one, we should have twice as many supercharges in the four-dimensional theory. So how does this work more, more precisely? So we start with the color of threefold, and these are the fundamental forms of the color of threefold. But what I just told you is that for Euler number zero, you have an SU2 structure, and this means we have some holomorphic one form and a triple of uh, real two forms, but these are not closed anymore. So the D of this is uh, uh, equal to some torsion classes. So that's analogous to what uh, Gary Shu talked in, uh, in his talk about. So now you can do a similar kind of uh, kaluza klein reduction as in standard Calabiao, okay, three times the two compactifications. And now you get from this torsion class, you get extra couplings, and this leads to an gauged n equals four supergravity. And the torsion classes, more precisely, map into some gauge group, and this gives a solvable gauge group usually. So how is this related to the original story? Actually, if you consider this n equals four supergravity and you compute the vacuum of the theory, it's not n equals four, it's just n equals two, so you have some partial super Higgs mechanism. And if you just uh, this, um, compute the effective theory in this vacuum, you get an n equals two supergravity. So that's some kind of Higgs mechanism. And if you integrate out the heavy fields, you get from the gauge n equals four supergravity to n equals two supergravity. So first I want to mention that um, there are many Calabiaus of order number zero, so there are a lot of SU2 structures, and in principle, you should be able to apply this to all of them. So we have a lot of examples, and what can we do with this result, with this gauge n equals four supergravity? Well, the first point is, the n equals four supergravity is very constrained. Actually, there's no free continuous parameter. All parameters are integer valued. So it's much more constrained, actually, than n equals two supergravity. So actually, the modelized basis of the n equals two supergravity should somehow be special or fit into a certain class. So the question is, what are the constraints on these n equals two modelized bases? Second, in this procedure, when you get this gauge n equals four supergravity, you know that there's an n equals two vacuum. So this extends previously known results on this spontaneous partial supersymmetry breaking from n equals four to n equals two. And because you have so many new structures, thank you, because you have so many new examples, you, you might extend this vastly. So other, other questions are about the quantum properties of the series. So maybe you can, by using this n equals four supergravity, you can make new, new theorems about instant term corrections and self mirrors for such manifolds. For instance, Ferrara, Harvey, Swaringer, and Waffer, already 15 years ago, computed or considered one of these examples because it was self-mirror. Another question is, so, so far, BPS spectra of gauge supergravities are maybe not even defined, but for sure not known so far. So maybe by, by relating some gauge supergravity, some engaged supergravity, maybe we can learn more about BPS spectra in these cases. So, and, and furthermore, there are more mathematical theorems in the literature that might ensure SU2 structures for certain compactifications. So, and... Uh... Sorry about that. Okay, unfortunately, no time for questions. Okay, so that's it. I'd like to, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank all of our Gong Show speakers for an excellent set of talks. Uh, it's quite amazing how they all stayed in their five-minute limit. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.